just want to thank the Lord this morning. Amen. Brother, Brother Snyder just give me some good news. And I just got, I'm going to blow up if I don't say something. Okay, praise and the Lord. Uh, he's telling me that this, 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 this problem he has is just about cured up. Yeah, yeah. amen. And yeah. what a blessing. Prayer answer. Amen. We've been praying for him. Been praying for that. Been praying for Jeff. Just tons and tons of blessings. Amen. The times. Amen. Just keeps happening. Amen. He's still on the throne. Amen. 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 Yeah, he's had that ulcer on there for a while, haven't you, Brother Harry? Yeah. Almost. Almost. Amen. 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 What a blessing. Amen. Amen. It's a blessing. All right. Jeremiah chapter 14. And we'll begin reading there in verse 7, uh, 7 to 10 there. Jeremiah 14, verse 7. O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. O the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof, in time of trouble, why shouldest thou be as a stranger in the land and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night? Why shouldest thou be as a man astonished, as a mighty man that cannot save? Yet thou, O Lord, art in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name. Leave us not. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for each one here this morning. We pray that you'll bless, uh, Father, the preaching of the word of God. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to uh, live for you in these last days. And uh, God, help us, Lord, those that are not saved. We pray, uh, Father, that you might save their souls from hell. And uh, God, that you would give them absolute assurance of eternal life through your word. And uh, Father, we just ask you, Lord, to help us to say exactly uh, what you would have us to say today uh, to these dear people. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, bless each one, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Amen. We read here in Jeremiah 14, verses 7 to 10. And of course, this is the uh, message from Jeremiah. And uh, God uh, spoke to Jeremiah about some things here. And of course, uh, the, the people here have rejected God. Jeremiah is a weeping prophet, he's called. And uh, there's judgment all through the book of Jeremiah. Amen. And when you read Jeremiah, it's one of the, really, to be honest with you, it's one of the most negative books as far as uh, judgment uh, in the Bible because the people of Israel would not uh, get right or stay right with the Lord. Uh, I want to call your attention here to verse number 10 where the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. Thus, he says, have they loved to wander. I want to bring a message entitled, Why We Wander Away from the Lord. Why We Wander Away from the Lord. The Bible says in Proverbs 21, verse 16, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. And then in chapter 27 and verse 8, it says in Proverbs, As a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is a man that wandereth from his place. And I want to bring a message on why we wander from the Lord. All these let, uh, points will be in the letter D. First of all, I want to say, number one, that uh, we wander away from the Lord because of deregulations or freedom from rules and restrictions. Deregulations or freedom from rules and uh, restrictions. In Deuteronomy 31, 29, Moses said this. Uh, he's getting ready to depart from them. He's getting ready to die. He said to the people of Israel, For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, 
because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Moses says there in Deuteronomy 31, 29, that after my death, he said, you people are going to corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I've commanded you. So one of the first reasons why we wander from the Lord is deregulations or uh, a lack of rules and restrictions. Some people wander from the Lord when restraints are removed or when they get out from under the protection of authority. They have so much uh, so-called freedom that they abuse it and don't know how to handle it. They feel they can do anything they wish, and they do. What they do gets them into trouble sometimes. Young people that leave home, especially after they graduate from high school, can be overwhelmed by their newfound freedoms. Uh, some people get involved in some young people get involved in drug abuse, alcohol, sexual immorality, uh, even false religions and false cults. And uh, the prodigal son is a classic example of somebody who wandered away from the Lord, and he was damaged and scarred by his freedom of restraint, freedom that leads to the destruction of our lives and harmful addictions and sinful bondage. That's not freedom at all. That's what the world calls freedom, but that isn't freedom. A lot of young people think that. The prodigal son demonstrated this truth when he wasted and lost everything. If he were here, he would testify that the journey on the hog pen trail is not as glamorous as we think it is. Amen. We're studying uh, Sunday nights. We've been going through the book of John, and we're in chapter 10. And verse 10 over there says, Jesus and I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. Now, <coughs> excuse me. The devil's job is to make people think, especially a lot of young people. You know, the devil told me this when I got saved years ago. He said, you don't want to get saved. You won't be able to have no fun. You won't be able to do this and do that and everything. The devil, the demons of hell will tell you that, especially you young people here uh, this morning. The devil will tell you that stuff because he doesn't want you to get saved. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. But you talk to some people, they say, well, I can't get saved because I won't be able to do this and that. No, God don't want you to sin. But see, after you get saved, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The devil didn't tell me that. But see, the devil just said, you won't be able to do all these things that you're doing and so forth. But he didn't tell me that after I got born again, I didn't want to do all that wicked trash yeah. and the things that I was doing. Yeah. So one of the reasons why we wander away from the Lord is that deregulations uh, or freedom from rules and restrictions. I want to tell you what, that just like this building here, we have walls in this building. There's walls, there's boundaries. A child needs boundaries. A teenager needs boundaries. I'm glad that my parents who are still unsaved today, but I'll tell you what, when we were at home and we got 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, I'm telling you, there were boundaries there. And they said, as long as you're living in this house, this is the rules and regulations. Amen. You know what I said? I said, I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to move out of here. I can do my own thing and do what I want to do. So I did. Now, when I was living at home at 18, I, my mom and dad, back in the 70s, they made me pay $15. Try to teach me a little bit of character, you know. They paid, yeah. made me pay $15 a week room and board. <laughs> back in 70, uh, what year was that? 75, <laughs> 76, 75. So I thought, this is terrible. $15. You all seen how much I ate back then? You think I eat a lot now. <laughs> and the dad told people... <laughs> 40 years, some years ago, he told me this joke, and he said, when Steve moved out, it was like getting a $100 a week raise. Praise <laughs> God, hallelujah, <laughs> Jesus. But anyways, and so I said, I threw that up in mom and dad's face, and I can't wait to get out here. I can't, all these restrictions got to be in at a certain time. I can't handle it. I don't like it. So I got my own apartment. Guess what? I had rent, utilities. I had car payment, car insurance. You know, gasoline, car repairs at times or whatever. And I, I, I start thinking, man, that $15 a week don't sound too bad. <laughs> Can I come back home? No, I didn't do that. But anyways, but there's reasons why we wander away from the Lord. Deregulations or freedom from rules and restrictions. Number two, 
We wander from the Lord because of deception. Deception calls us to wander from God, being deceived. Psalms 40, verse 4, Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. A lot of people have been turned aside to lies. Proverbs 12, 26, The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. I want to tell you something, young people. You might not understand it at all right now, but there are a lot of people in this whole world, if you listen to them, they will deceive you and lead you astray. Right. They Not just spiritually. I'm talking about morally and every way else. I'm telling you, the way of the wicked leads people astray. I never cease to be amazed at how gullible people are and how easily some people are deceived. Lies that seem so obvious to me seem as truth to others in our country. Uh, I'm not just talking about spiritually, I'm talking about politically too, but don't get me started on that. People today are duped by the deceptions of a wicked world. Now, here are some common deceptions and lies that can cause people to wander away from Christ. Uh, people say sinful living is fun and it'll not hurt you. Well, it is pleasurable for a season, but that season doesn't last forever. It says about Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. In Hebrews 11, 25, sin only lasts for a little while. Sinful living is fun. They say it will not hurt you. Yes, it will hurt you. A God does not care about what you do, they'll say. Yes, he does. They say you have plenty of time to live for God later. The devil told me that. They say getting you... Uh, Getting your own way will always make you happy. Oh, I'm going to tell you what. It might make you happy for a few minutes or a few days, but I'll tell you what, yeah, there could be a bitter end to getting your way all the time. God doesn't care what you do in private, they say, only what you do in public. God cares what you do anytime, day or night, public, right. private, or anything. Amen. When people counsel you to do things that are totally contrary to the Word of God, Mark it down. They are deceptive and they are deceptions that can lead to wandering. That, that's why it's so important to know the truth of the Word of God. Ignorance of truth leads to deception. It leads to being led astray from God. Knowing the truths of God's Word will help you recognize deception when you're faced with it, trying to be deceived. I read this in late September 1864, Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest was leading his troops north from Decatur, Alabama, toward Nashville, Tennessee. But to make it to Nashville, Forrest would have to defeat the Union Army at Athens, Alabama. When the Union commander, Colonel Wallace Campbell, refused to surrender, Forrest asked for a personal meeting and took Campbell on an inspection of his troops. Each time they left a detachment, the Confederate soldiers simply packed up and moved to another position, artillery and all. Yeah. Forrest and Campbell would then arrive at the new encampment and continue to tally up the impressive number of Confederate soldiers and weaponry. By the time they returned to the fort, Campbell was convinced he could not win and surrendered unconditionally because he's seen all of the opposing weaponry. Satan, the devil, does the same thing to you and I. He distracts and deceives us into thinking that we are already defeated. No, it's no use. You can't live for God. You might as well just hang it up, man. You can't live for God. The devil will put that in your head every second that he possibly can, but you can live for God if you'll yield to the Lord and the things of God. Amen. He distracts and deceives us into thinking that we're already defeated and there's no use in attempting to live for Christ and fighting God's battles. We give up in, in our we give up and uh, and we we say, what's the use? And we wander away uh, from God in sin. And so uh, the second reason is deception causes us to wander from God. The third reason that people wander away from the Lord, and they wander away by the millions. There's people all over America that are saved, but they're just wandering around. They're just wandering around to and fro. Number three is the desire 
for sexual fulfillment causes us to wander. The desire for sexual fulfillment. James 1.14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Deuteronomy 17.17, 17, neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn uh, not away, neither shall he great, greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Uh, the kings of Israel were not to multiply their wives lest their heart turn away from God. That's what happened to Solomon. I mean, he had hundreds and hundreds. And, uh, you know, Judges 16, 5, And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her, Delilah, and said unto her, Entice him, Samson, and see where in his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. Samson's desire for the sexual satisfaction of his lust led him to wander from the Lord. He ended up losing his strength, his sight, or his vision. You get messing with sin, you'll lose your vision for soul. You'll lose your vision for God and the things of God. He lost his strength, spiritual strength, his, his sight, his freedom, and his life. Samson's a whole other message. But many a Christian has wandered away from the Lord because of the desire for sexual satisfaction. And we are bombarded constantly on the internet, on computer, on television, radio, magazines, newspapers, with all the filthy trash of the world. And to try to keep a halfway decent pure mind is you have to work at it today in the society that we live. Christian teenagers have wandered from God because of a boy or girl they were uh, dating or courting and then became sexually intimate. you got to say dating or courting because there's some Christians they don't believe in dating. Because they say dating, you're just going out and messing around. And then they say you got a court. So if you said if you go to some churches I go, if I said dating, they'd look at me like I was a heretic, like there's something wrong with me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not godly, I'm not. You know, I'm carnal, I'm wicked, you know, or something. So I got to say, courting or dating. <laughs> Christians have a lot of hang-ups about that. But anyways, uh, they, they're dating and then they become sexually intimate. Adults have wandered from the Lord because they married an unsaved person or a carnal Christian. Many marriages and ministries have been devastated by sexual immorality. If you're single, marry God's best for you if that's his will. Wait on God. Wait for his best. If you are married, cherish your spouse. Cherish your spouse. Sexual fulfillment in marriage is ordained of God and a great gift from the Lord. Enjoy your wife or your husband. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable at all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Sex inside of marriage is wonderful, but outside of marriage, it'll become a burden and lead to a broken heart and a broken life. You say, preacher, I can't believe you're saying some of these things. Somebody better say something. Adultery, I mean, people hear all this trash all the time on TV and the internet. Adultery, a preacher preaches something about it, and they, you know, a lot of people they think you know, they go crazy. Adultery splinters and obliterates families and will create a boatload of headaches and heartaches for you as you reap the consequences of your sin. I don't have time to go into marriage and divorce and all kind of thing. I taught verse by verse in 1 Corinthians. But to make a long story short, if you want to get the CDs, you can ask Matt about it. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about marriage, divorce, separation, remarriage. All right? Uh, we, we preach that you know, if you're married, stay together. Stay together, you know, forgive and forget and go on for God. But I believe personally, you can get mad and disagree, whatever you want to do. But I believe personally in the Bible, there are three grounds for a Christian to uh, be married uh, and marry somebody else. Be divor uh, divorced and marry somebody else. Death desertion, and fornication. They're in, for in 1 Corinthians 7 and Romans 7. If your spouse dies, you're at liberty, 1 Corinthians 7, 39, to be married to whom you will only in the Lord. That means they have to be a saved person. If you're saved, you're supposed to marry a saved person. All right? Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. All right? Let me tell you this. 
Not everybody that says they're saved is saved. Yeah. Young people, let me tell you something. I, I can't get off on all this, but we'll be here all day. But uh, every Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes down the road is not saved. All right? You girls, I want to tell you something. These guys know how to say, I'm a Christian, because they want you. And vice versa. The girls know how to say, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and three weeks after you're married, uh, time to go to church. I don't want to go. Wait. Make sure. Make sure you still a preacher. I, I got married and my wife and my husband, they, they act like they were spiritual apostle Paul. They was a giant for God. And then three years or five years or ten years later, this happened, that happened. And we, and this happened. There's three grounds. Death, if your spouse dies. Desertion, if they desert you. 1 Corinthians 7, 15. And a couple other verses in 1 Corinthians 7. I don't have time to teach it now. I taught it. You can get CDs from Matt. And then, uh, and also death, desertion, fornication. If your spouse commits fornication, you you really ought to try to forgive them and go on in the marriage. That's always best. Especially if you have children. All right? Especially. But you ought to try to go ahead. But if you can't, just you can't get over that thing and you just can't, you feel like it's over and you can never trust them again or whatever, you're allowed to put them away and you're allowed to remarry, but it has to be only in the Lord. And that's 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 not my philosophy or my my, my uh, belief or something I conjured up. That's in the Bible. Death, desertion, and fornication. God is not as rigid as a lot of preachers would have you or churches would have you think. I mean, there's some people, they think if they, their spouse leaves them, they can't get remarried. If your spouse deserts you and leaves you, you wouldn't believe the number of men sitting in churches by themselves in this country, by themselves, and their spouse deserted them. They went home and they said, honey, I got saved. I got born again. She says, oh, you did? I'm leaving. See you later, bud. Yeah. I don't want that Jesus junk. I don't want that church junk. I'm out of here. And they go. And uh, you say, what happens to that? All right. The Bible says that you can get remarried. You can get remarried. And uh, if your spouse dies, death, desertion, or fornication. And uh, they commit fornication. They join their body up to somebody else. They've broken the marriage vow. And they have gone outside the marriage. And according to the Bible, uh, you can put them away. And you can get remarried, according to the Bible. If your spouse dies, you can get remarried only in the Lord. Death, desertion, they desert you. They say, get out of here. Let me tell you something. You mean to tell me a 20, 25, 23, 25, 28-year-old young man who gets married and his wife says that she's saved or whatever, or whatever the deal is, and they get married and then she says goodbye. I don't want nothing to do with this Christianity stuff. I'm out of here. I ain't going to church. I'm in church and God and Bible and religion and all this and witnessing and soul winning and prayer and I'm out of here. It happens thousands all the time, all over the country. You're telling me God expects that young man in the prime of his life without going into detail, he has to stay single? You think God's that rigid of a God? He's not. He's not. If that person deserts them, leaves them, and he hasn't committed fornication, he hasn't done that, anything like that, and she says, I don't know what he says, or she says, I'm out of here, whatever it is. They, they die, they desert, or they uh, death, desertion, or fornication. That spouse that is, um, that is still there is allowed to get remarried, but it has to be a Christian person. You're warned against the remarriage because you'll have trouble in the flesh. Read 1 Corinthians 7, 27 and 28. He said, Paul said, I spare you, but trust uh, such shall have trouble in the flesh. You know what trouble in the flesh is? Here's what it is. All right. What it is is when you get remarried, you have a tendency in your mind to compare your present spouse with the spouse you used to have. Then if she has children from a previous marriage and you, sir, have children from a previous marriage and then some people get married and have one or two children among themselves. So you've got his, hers and ours. You know that presents some problems sometimes. And God isn't stupid. He knows that. That's the trouble in the flesh. All right? Well, I don't like the way you treat my kids. 
What do you mean? You're too hard on my kids. You don't discipline them, uh, your kids when they do something wrong, but you did this with my kid. You grounded him for this. All that kind of stuff, honey. All that kind of stuff enters into the picture. Especially if the kids are young. you got many years to go through all that. After 15, 16, 18, you only got a couple, three years left. Maybe you can get through that. I'm just trying to help you. I ain't trying to be mean this morning. I'm just trying to tell you. I don't know who, what situation anybody's in this, in this church here. All right? I know a couple people, but, you know. But I'm just telling you, all kinds of things enter in. And that's why God says, get married, stay married, and rough it out and do the best you can. And you say, well, my wife left me, or my husband left me, or my, they were a jerk, or they did this and that. I'm just telling you, according to the Bible, there's three grounds for remarriage for a Christian. Your spouse dies, they desert you, they fornicate. You can put them away. And you're allowed to get remarried only in the Lord. You say, well, I've been divorced and uh, I didn't have any of those three grounds. You know what you do? You've probably already done it. You say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. You know, I've done wrong. And you go on and you serve God. Amen. And quit. I know people that have gone through things like this and they kick themselves for the next 30 years. And they feel guilty and everything. Don't feel guilty. Go on for God and live for God. Serve God and be what God <coughs> wants you to be. The past is gone. The past is it. It's gone. Go ahead and serve God now and, and do what God wants you to do. Amen? Amen. The desire for sexual fulfillment causes us to wander. And uh, it was about 9 o'clock at night. A man dashed into the doctor's office in a highly nervous condition. And he explained to the doctor that he had been in a very bad state all day long. The doctor, in his best professional manner, asked if anything had happened to shock or upset his nerves. No, the man answered, unless it was a letter I received this morning. He showed the doctor a letter which stated in part, quote, if you don't stop running around with my wife, I'm going to blow your brains out. <laughs> Unquote. The doctor answered, well, that's a comparatively simple matter, sir. Why don't you just stop it? <laughs> the patient's face fell as he said, but doctor, the fool forgot to sign his name. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you that didn't get that, <laughs> the guy went out with more than one woman don't know which woman it is because he didn't sign his name the husband the desire for sexual fulfillment causes us to wander whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding but he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul a wound and dishonor shall he get his reproach shall not be wiped away Proverbs 6 32 and 33 Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Uh, occasionally I have young people ask me, uh, I'm talking about people like, you know, 19, 20, 22, 25. And uh, they, they have a boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, and they say, uh, we, uh, we, we have problems, you know, we're tempted, you know, we give in to temptation, different things. And, I, and they say, we feel guilty, we're sorry, we're all this and that. And I said, I said you love her. They said, what should we do? I said, do you love her? And he, most times they'll say, yeah, I believe I do love her. And I'll say to her, do you love him? Yes. Get married. Hey. Instead of burning in lust, get married. Amen? You say, well, what if it isn't God's will? Then separate. Yeah. Quit dating or courting. Amen. <laughs> dating or courting. And quit, you know, quit going out with each other. And quit getting alone with each other. Be around other people. Be around other people. Don't make provisions for the flesh. Don't provide ways to fulfill the lust of the flesh. You say, what do you think I am? Some pervert preacher? I don't trust my flesh. I don't trust your flesh. I don't trust my kids' flesh. I don't trust any flesh. Folks, flesh is flesh. Amen. And Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Amen. Paul said that in Romans 7, 18. I'm saying that the desire for sexual fulfillment calls us to wander from God. And that's exactly what's happened to a lot of people. 
I'll close with this illustration here. I've got several more points. I'll maybe finish this tonight. I think I will finish this message tonight because I got a lot of things I need to say. And uh, <clears throat> instead of going John tonight, we'll do this message here, finish it. But probably no story better illustrates how the sweet stolen water of adultery turns invariably <clears throat> sour than the story of Camelot. In this epic tale, the relationship of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere is, tr is trespassed upon when Arthur's most renowned and trusted knight, Lancelot, Lancelot, <coughs> excuse me, gingerly slips his toe across the marital boundary. It started with a look, an innocent look, without premeditation or evil intent. But it was a short, slippery step from a look to lust, from infatuation to infidelity. The look eventually led to a touch. The touch sometime later led to a kiss. The kiss led to adultery and adultery to tragedy. Dr. Alan Jones has a thing. I'll just mention this and I'll close. He talks about, and I know a lot of people say he's old fogey, he's an old fogey, and he's got these old archaic ways about him and about dating and courting. He calls it courting. And uh, he said, he said, uh, when he teaches his young people in the church when he pastored for 40 years, he said, I teach that when you go out, first of all, you have a chaperone, and the boy and the girl don't touch each other. Now, I won't ask my wife to come up here, but if my wife and I, you say, preacher, this is old fogey stuff. Come on now. This is 1950s <laughs> stuff, man. Yeah, I know it might help keep a lot of headaches away from you. Right. If I hold her hand, just touch her hand, hold her hand, on one, one of the first dates, courting. <laughs> All right? Then the next time, what do you think it's going to be? It's probably going to be hugging. What's the next time going to be? Next time is going to be, you say, preacher, do you have to say, yes, I got to do this. The next time is going to be kissing. And from there, God knows what. What he, Dr. Jones was saying was, is that the first touch, just touch, touch, that leads to all kinds of things. He's got some good books on recording and for young people. It's good. Most people don't. They, they don't. They think he's 1940s, you know. But I'll tell you, it'll help a lot of young people. Yeah. It'll help a lot of young people. And I'm not. I'm not trying to be mean towards anybody that's had the, the misfortune of going through bad marriage or marriages. We're not. We're hey. I'm a filthy, wicked, rotten, low-down sinner saved by the grace of God. I ain't nobody. I know what I am. I don't think I'm better than anybody. I'm saying these things to try to help you. You say, well, I've already messed up, preacher. Well, go on and live for God. Hey. Just go on and live for God. Don't, you know, don't kick yourself all the time. I know, some, I know some people that just kick themselves all the time about this stuff. Go on for God but they can cause you to wander away. There are people that have quit going to church because their spouse left them. They've been through the misfortune of the marriages and divorces and things like that. And they say, you know, the church won't want us. The church won't want you. <coughs> we want you. Amen. We love you. I preach this way to help the young people that haven't been married yet. 
and eventually will. I know some of these younger ones here, it's going to be several years, obviously, but I'm just saying that, that I wish I wish somebody would have said these things that I'm saying. I'm not trying to brag on myself. I'm just saying, I wish somebody would have said that some of the things that I'm saying now, I wish I would have heard. I grew up in an unsaved home. My mom and dad are still lost, as I've mentioned. I wasn't taught none of this stuff. I was 20 years old before I got saved. I've seen and heard things and experienced things from 13 to 20 that I wished I never would have. And you try to you try to get halfway spiritual and pray and seek God and try to memorize scriptures and try to think on God and the holy things that God and the devil put all this junk in your head and it's like, ah, get out! <laughs> That's why, young people, you get saved at a young age and stay pure and clean and in church. You have a tremendous advantage right. yeah. on lots of people in this country. Amen. A lot of people. And don't let the devil tell you, you're missing out on all this sin and sex and all these drugs and smoking reefer. Let's go get high. Get drunk. You're not missing nothing. Yeah. You aren't missing nothing but a bunch of headaches and heartaches. Yeah. Ask these people sitting around these older folks that have been through things. They'll tell you. That's why I preach these things. I'm not trying to be mean to people that's been through some of this. And, and we're not trying to cast doubt on you or anything like that. We're not. We're trying to keep people that hasn't been through this stuff. Trying to keep. Trying to help them. We want to help everybody we can. I just gave you three points. I got a bunch of more points to preach. I'll finish this message tonight, Lord. Well, let's stand if you would.